بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو انگلش فور فائیو فور ان دا پریویس لیکچرز وی ہیو اسٹارٹیڈ ڈسکسنگ دا کلاسیکل کرٹیسزم اینڈ دا رومانٹک کرٹیسزم اینڈ وی ہیو گیون یو دا ڈیفینیشن آف دا کلاسیکل کرٹیسزم ایز ویل از دا رومانٹک کرٹیسزم کلاسیکل کرٹیسزم میں تو ہم اینشنس کو فالو کر رہے ہیں جیسے کہ آپ کو بتایا تھا لاسٹ لیکچر میں کہ ایوری تھنگ دیٹ دا اینشنٹ سیٹ آؤٹ فار آس ایوری رول دیٹ دے ہیو ڈسائڈیڈ اپان اٹ واز فالوڈ بلائنڈلی اینڈ پیپل ڈی ناٹ ایون پیپل دا کلاسز دے ڈن ڈیئر ٹو ڈیویٹ فرام دوز رولس لیکن یہ جو اس کے بعد ایک ایسا ایرا آتا ہے انگلش لٹریچر میں جہاں پہ پیپل دے اسٹارٹ ایڈ کوشچننگ دوز آئیڈیاز دوز رولس دوز پرنسپلس اینڈ دے اسٹارٹ ایڈ فوکسنگ اور اپریشیٹنگ مور دا ماسٹرز آف انگلش لٹریچر ایٹ دیٹ ٹائم وی ہیو دا ایگزامپل آف سیمیول جانسن ہے After Samuel Johnson, this thing further moved on and it moved on towards uh, the era of new classicism or the Augustan age. People believing in new classicism or following it and following this trend of Augustan poetry or Augustan age were the people who were classist but they were of a different kind. They were too staunch, they were too strict as far as classicism goes and they followed whatever Aristotle or Horace or Virgil or Ornett, Ovid, all of these, whatever they have written, they followed their rules religiously almost. They, all of these poets, they considered themselves to be as good as Homer was or as good as Virgil was or they considered themselves equal to those poets. They actually followed the golden era of classical poetry which was during the emperor, uh, during the reign of Emperor Augustus. And whatever the classical poets of that era, whatever they decided upon, whatever form, procedure, balance, feelings, emotions, if any allowed in the poetry, whatever they decided upon, the Augustans, they exactly followed it. لیکن آگسٹنس کے بعد دیر کیم اے ٹائم وین دس فرینچ ریولیوشن واز ہیپننگ دس انڈسٹریل ریولیوشن واز ہیپننگ ان دا ورلڈ واز اے وار آف انڈیپینڈنس گوئنگ آن ان امیرکا اینڈ آل دس لیڈ ٹو دا پولیٹیکل انڈیپینڈنس پولیٹیکل فری تھنکنگ آف ہیومن بینگس آف پیپل لیونگ ان انگلینڈ ایٹ دیٹ ٹائم دے ویل لبریٹیڈ مینٹلی ایز ویل ایز پولیٹیکلی دس پولیٹیکل لبریشن اٹ لیڈ ٹوورڈس a different kind of criticism, a different kind of appreciation of literature. People started believing that literature cannot be a set of rules. It cannot be assessed on the basis of a few principles. You cannot assess a good piece of um, uh, literature or a good piece of art just because uh, you can't say that this particular thing is good just because it has been following certain rules. Because you know the classes, as I've already told you, they followed uh, certain rules and certain regulations. They said that um, پوئٹری میں امیجنیشن نہیں ہو سکتی ہے فیلنگ نہیں ہو سکتی ہے اس میں کوئی اس میں اس میں سبجیکٹیوٹی نہیں ہو سکتی اٹ ہیز ٹو بی آبجیکٹیو اٹ ہیز ٹو پریزینٹ دا ریالٹیز آف لائف ایز دے ایگزٹ دے بلیوڈ ان بلیک اینڈ وائٹ ولڈ بٹ ایز دا رومانٹک کرٹکس اور دا نیو ٹری دا نیو کریڈ آف لٹری کرٹکس دیٹ ڈیولپڈ ایز اے ریزلٹ آف آل دس پولیٹیکل اپ ہی ول ان دا ورلڈ دے بلیو دیٹ لٹریچر اینڈ پوئٹری از سم تھنگ دیٹ شوڈ بی کلوز ٹو دا ہارٹ اٹ شوڈ بی اے اسپونٹینیس اوور فلو آف ایموشنس اٹ شوڈ ناٹ بی سم تھنگ دیٹ از یو نو ٹیکن اے لٹل ٹو ٹو سیریسلی اٹ از سم تھنگ دیٹ شوڈ بی دیٹ شوڈ کم فرام ود ان اٹ شوڈ بی اے اسپونٹینیس اوور فلو آف feelings of emotions, there should be a flight of fancy, there should be a flight of imagination. Imagination, according to romantic critics, was the essence of poetry. It was the spirit of poetry. It, 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 it is something that drives you to feel. So if there is no imagination, the romantic critics believe that there is no point in writing poetry. So cl classist or romantics are two extremes of uh, one thing. Criticism ki do extremes hain wo ye hain ki ek wo the jo classist the aur dusre jo romantics the. Aur inke ideas completely differ karte hain. Na sirf subject matter pe, themes pe, balki form aur diction pe bhi. Jisse jo classist the, jo Augustans the, they had a very different idea about what diction should be followed or what language should be followed or even classes se aage augustan se pahunche pahunche so language was too harsh it's when i say harsh i don't mean that it was you know saying bad things or saying rude things it was very strict it was too superfluous it was too extraordinary the language used it was uh, it was a little too artificial because in order to prove their um, uh, scholarliness in order to prove that they are too learned they used words that were not 
you know, needed at that time, but just to prove themselves, to prove the knowledge of the classics, and to prove the knowledge of the language. Uh, they had used references, they've used allusions, they have used um, other uh, linguistic techniques and their uh, literary techniques, devices, which uh, were not hardly necessary. To romantic critics, they, they believed that the language of a piece of poetry or the language of a piece of literature should be uh, very much uh, similar to that of uh, of a common man. If it's not similar to the common man, he would not find it interesting enough. This is what we have already discussed in Milton's case. Mein bhi, ki if the language is tedious, then it would be difficult for you to enjoy the reading. Even if the poem is extraordinary, even if it has a lot of good things about it, if the language is tedious, if the language is hard, if the diction proves to be difficult for you to understand, you would not enjoy it as such. It would not hook you up. So Wordsworth, who's a basic romantic critic, and you just the romanticism ki movement baat karte hai, we have to talk about Wordsworth and Coleridge and all these people. So he was one of the few people who think ke subject matter be simple hona chahiye, a language or diction be just a ki jai, wo bhi simple honi chahiye. Hai? And they also believed ke uh, ye jo ek concept tha ke jo subject matters hain, they should be of you know certain philosophical nature they should answer certain questions of life the romantics they do not believe the subject matter to be of you know it should be of something of extraordinary nature they said it should be so close to everyday life it should be something that happens to everyone almost every day it should be a piece of nature it should be you know something that you see on the sky anything beautiful anything ugly anything that's a part of nature anything that happens Around you, so in the subject matter themes, ko bhi thoda sa um, mellow down kiya tha. So, we have to decide what we have to do, what we have to do, what we have to do, what classicism and romanticism. Mein kya farak hai. So, we are going to continue with um, the romantic critics. And uh, romantic critics, when you are going to say that, you will be astonished that Wordsworth was a poet. He wrote this uh, uh, lyrical ballads and he wrote all these poems. So, why, would we call him a, why, we, why do we call him a critic here? The thing is that you have to keep in mind when Wordsworth wrote lyrical ballad, he was trying to set out a new tone to these things. He was trying to decide something, uh, to give something else to people, something that people were not used to. He was giving out a new taste. So, when you introduce new things, you have to develop a sort of context. So, when you introduce new things, you have to context develop a new things. So, when context Wordsworth has lyrical ballads, ki surat mein, preface to lyrical ballads, ki surat mein, uh, develop a new things. In the preface, he tries to explain uh, to people why he had written what he had written, why his poetry is like this, why does he, why he has um, chosen these uh, subject matters, why have the, why, why have he used this simple language, why has he talked about the rustic and the common life? So there has to be reasons for it. He has done something out of ordinary. He has done something that was not done in that time and place. So he had to explain himself. Achha, ab aapne ye bhi yaad rakhne ki preface kya cheez hoti hai. If you're not familiar with the concept, in the beginning of every book, there is one um, piece. There is a one piece of prose. There, uh, sort of an essay. Kabhi wo dusre log bhi likhte hain, or kabhi writer himself writes it. It's sort of an explanation of what he's writing about. The prefaces, they um, were quite in fashion. Even now, they're quite in fashion. So, so uh, a declaration of intention. So this was a declaration of intention as far as Wordsworth goes. Let us discuss Wordsworth as a romantic critic, and then we will move on to the preface to ly lyrical ballad and discuss what was his theory of poetry. What does he call poetry? How does he define it? What does he think um, is the end of what should be the end of poetry, and what should be the effect of poetry? What should be the subject matter of poetry, and what kind of diction or language should be used in poetry? He answers all these questions when he discusses his idea of poetry. So let's start with Wordsworth as a romantic critic. So Wordsworth was the first one to give a new turn to discussion as the nature of poetry by connecting it with feeling and making it dependent upon imagination. I've already told you that the classes, they believe in a different thing. They believed that imagination, feelings, emotions have no part whatsoever in literature. They believed in, you know, in the, in the geometric concision. They believed in a geometric precision. Things have to be placed such that there's no room for feeling or imagination there. They wanted people to take things as they're presented. However, Wordsworth 
I can talk about some other writers as well, but as we are discussing, as we're discussing Wordsworth, I'm going to focus on him. I'm going to tell you, what I'm trying to tell you here is that Wordsworth focused on uh, the person's point of view. He not only focused on the reader's point of view, but he also focused on the writer's point of view. What was the poet at that time when he wrote it? And who read it, what did he think? What were his feelings? What were his imaginations? What were his flights? Which flight of fancy did he take after that? So, we have to keep in mind that this, the, this stark difference between classists and romantics, it becomes clear with this very first sentence that he focused on imagination and he focused on um, connecting poetry with feelings. He couldn't separate the two things, whereas the classes, they completely separated the two things. Wordsworth believed that poetry cannot be separated from feelings, poetry cannot be separated from uh, imagination as well. It depends on imagination rather. His views on language and poetic diction are even more strikingly original. They are original. Why do we call them original? Because aapke paas jo trend chal raha tha, that was of classicism, that was of following the ancients, the rules set out by ancients ki Greek tragedy likhni hai. To usme ye paanch characteristics, ye art characteristics hongi to bachi tragedy hogi. It would be more effective if it has these eight things in it. But he has written something that was original, something that was out of ordinary, something that was not done at that time. So, usna sirf language of poetry diction pe nahi kya, balki he was also original. Indeed, that they provoked much criticism when they were first when they were first produced. Jab usne apni ideas diye na ki jo language hai, kali subject matter nahi ki usne imagination pe focus kya or emotions pe focus kya or feelings pe focus kya, balki usne jo form hai, us pe bhi focus kya ki uski form bhi different honi chahiye. Aur jo usne form ke liye idea diya. It was um, quite original. It was not, I mean, he didn't focus on, you know, complicated words and metaphors and a lot of similes. His language was very simple. It's known as, it's known as the language of the common man. He didn't differentiate between the language of poetry and language of common man. He said that the language of common man should be the language of poetry. These two should not be separated as the poetry is about the common man. It's about the feelings and the emotions of the person, common person, then it should be in the language that the common person understands. So this was an original idea. You have to keep in mind this term original because original is something that has been done for the first time. That's not, you know, it's not borrowed. It's not an idea that he's taken from someone and said that he's going to do this and you know, this would be, I mean, this would be something new, innovative. But it was not only innovative, it was original in its original sense, in its truest sense of the word original. It was something that was never done before. Wordsworth tries to bridge the gulf between prose and verse. Achha, ab he's not even saying ki, hota na ki ab you believe ki kuch words hain, kuch te terminologies hain, kuch aisi cheeze hoti hain, jo sirf prose ke liye hoti hain, kuch aise words hoti hain, jo prose mein use ho sakte hain, aur kuch aise subject matters hain, jo sirf prose ke subject matters hain. But Wordsworth, uh, in his poetry, ek aur tarah se deviate karta hai norm se, aur wo iste deviate karta hai, that he's going to uh, try and bring these two things together, prose and poetry. Prose and poetry, according to Wordsworth, cannot be differentiated on the basis of the subject matter or on the basis of the language used in them. According to Wordsworth, both these things should have the same kind of subject matter and the same kind of language. Later, Wordsworth pleads that prose and metrical compositions make use of the same material, namely words and phrases, and speak to a same sense. So he says, okay, why do you differentiate between these two things? There's no reason to differentiate between prose and poetry, or magical compositions as he says them, as he calls them. He does not call it poetry here. Calls them magical compositions. He says that they have the same tools. Tools kya hain? Words hain, sentences and they're put together in the form of a sentences or phrases or structures banate hain aap aur yahi structures jo hain wo unhi cheezon ke bare mein baat karte hain jinke bare mein prose mein ki jaati hai aur jinke bare mein poetry mein ki jaati hai so why should we differentiate between these two things meter adds no level of distinction to the language such a distinct emanates only from passionate use of language and is just generic not specific this means that जो मीटर आप ऐड करते हैं ना जब वर्ड्स ऐड कर रहे हैं जो सिलेबल्स उसके अंदर ऐड कर रहे हैं जो उसके अंदर रिदम ऐड कर रहे हैं 
वो उसकी पैशन को इंक्रीज नहीं करता बल्कि अकॉर्डिंग टू वर्ड्स विद पैशन इज डिपेंडेंट ऑन द सब्जेक्ट मैटर इट्स द सब्जेक्ट मैटर दैट इज गोइंग टू क्रिएट दिस फीलिंग इन यू इट्स इट्स दिस सब्जेक्ट मैटर दैट इज गोइंग टू मेक यू फील ऑल यू नो एक्सिलेटिंग और मेक यू फील हैप्पी और मेक यू फील नॉस्टैल्जिक सो वाई डिफ्रेंशिएट थिंग्स ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ द लैंग्वेज ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ द यू नो द टूल बेसिकली ही वॉन्ट्स टू से words of prose and poetry are not clearly demarcated so the words which can be used in prose can find place in poetry and vice versa so the po the point of the whole story here is that he tried to um it, he tried to finish this distinction that people used to have between prose and poetry uh, or the rather the language used for prose and poetry and the subject matter assigned to these particular genres of literature the certain um uh, subject matters can be dealt in poetry only and certain subject matters can be dealt in prose only so he said that there is no distinction between these two because in both the cases they both address the same kind of senses wo aapke intellect ko appeal kar rahe hain wo aapki poetic sensibility aesthetic sensibility ko appeal kar rahe hain and they are using the same tools they using the same structures for conveying their message so if the tools are the same and the um, addressee is the same so why do you make this distinction between prose and poetry there's no need to make this distinction between prose and poetry they are one and the same thing because you know the language and diction of one can be used in the other that is poetry can be used the words of for poetry can be used in prose and the words for prose can be used in poetry that is wise words so that's what he said here so words what make it clear that the use of meter in poetry is different from the use of poetic diction poetic diction ka matlab yahan pe ye hai ke it's the language that you use for poetry meter is something else you don't use meter in prose so he says of course you have to use meter in poetry that's how you going to create a verse so just because meter is used in poetry doesn't mean that the thing has to be um different from prose poetic diction is something else and meter is something else meter obeys certain rules whereas poetic diction is arbitrary and capricious मीटर तो चर्च एंड रूल्स पे फॉलो कर रहे हैं ना कि एक वर्ड है उसके इतने सिलेबल्स हैं तो जब एक 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 लाइन लिखी जाएगी किसी वर्स में तो अगर वो एम्बिक पेंटा मीटर है इट मीन्स दैट इट वुड हैव दिस मैनी सिलेबल्स ठीक है और इसमें से हर सेकंड सिलेबल जो है वो स्ट्रेस्ड होगा सो ही सेज के मीटर के तो रूल्स होते हैं लेकिन जो पोइटिक टिक्शन है जो लैंग्वेज यूज होती है पोइट्री में दैट्स आर्बिट्ररी आर्बिट्ररी इज समथिंग दैट कैन नॉट बी डिफाइंड समथिंग दैट कैन नॉट बी डिफाइंड ऑब्जेक्टिवली इट्स आर्बिट्ररी it's it's vague ठीक है it's capricious it cannot be captured it's it flows it's vague in the preface words with his defended meter on the grounds meter ko defend kar yet we have to add meter to poetry you cannot ignore meter just because you want to bridge this uh, gulf between prose and poetry or you think that if you are you know negating classes in everything else you have to let go of meter as well but he says that he has to use meter why because number 1 it adds charm and pleasure to the language dekhen jo cheez words mein likhi jati hai na uska apna charm hota hai theek hai bahut si cheeze hain jo ki agar aap seedhi prose ki tarah pad jayenge to it won't have the desired effect that is why when you reading poetry people ask you a good teacher would always ask you to read it out loud and he or she would read it out loud when you read something out loud it makes more sense it makes language more charming it gives you more pleasure बिकॉज उसमें जो रिदम आएगा जो उसकी इंटनेशन होगी जो उसका जिसको आप जीरो बम कहते हैं आवाज का वो जो है उसके अंदर और प्लेजर एड करेगा सो पोइट्री इज देयर फॉर द सेक ऑफ प्लेजर सो इफ गुड लैंग्वेज इज यूज बट इफ द एग्जैक्ट मीटर इज नॉट यूज देखिए जी जो चीज काफी से गिर जाती है वजन से गिर जाती है दिज नॉट प्रॉपर राइम स्कीम इफ दिज नो प्रॉपर मीटर द थिंग इज नॉट गोइंग टू साउंड गुड so the sounding good for words with was important it had to sound good because when it sound good it would it would provide you with pleasure um, that you get from language dekhi ek cheez hoti hai jisko aap kehte hain zuban ka chaska zuban ka chaska aapko tabhi achieve hota hai jab language mein ek proper rhythm hota hai जो पुराने उर्दू के राइटर्स हैं जैसे डिप्टी नज़ीर अहमद हैं या मुश्ताक अहमद यूसफी तो पुराने नहीं हैं लेकिन मुश्ताक अहमद यूसफी भी हैं उस उनकी जबान का चस्का है बेसिकली जिसके लिए लोग उसको पढ़ते हैं सो ही बिलीव्स कि मीटर एट दैट पर्टिकुलर फ्लेवर टू द लैंग्वेज सो यू हैव टू हैव मीटर फॉर द सेक ऑफ एडिंग दैट पर्टिकुलर पीस ऑफ फ्लेवर 
to yell. Second thing that is important, uh, that, that's why meter is important, is that poems written upon humble subjects and in a more naked and simple language, then the poems who own composition have continued to give pleasure from generation to generation. You have to focus. If your subject matter is humble, hai, hai? So you have to add certain, something extra to it. Hai? Certain compositions that have been written by the poet, about some certain rustic elements, about you know this solitary reaper or the daffodils or this wandering cloud, all these things. They're very simple things. They're very something that you see every day. अभी भी अगर आप बाहर निकलेंगे इतना अच्छा मौसम है, बादल आए हुए हैं, हवा चल रही है, किसी न किसी बादल की शेप आपको फैसिनेट करेगी, किसी न किसी खूबसूरत फूल को देख के आप आप इम्प्रेस होंगे, आपका दिल चाहेगा कि you talk about it. Words it is talked about such things. So he says that it's the meter. कि इतने सिंपल, इतने रस्टिक एलिमेंट को, इतने रस्टिक सब्जेक्ट मैटर को, जो चीज इतना इम्मोर्सल बना देती है, जो चीज इतना ज़्यादा प्रोलॉंग कर रही है, जिस चीज की वजह से पीपल कीप ऑन टॉकिंग अबाउट दिस थिंग्स इज़ द मीटर The end of poetry, according to Wordsworth, is to produce excitement. ठीक है? Uh, this much has been established. Pleasure, jo hai, pleasure is a form of excitement. You get excited, all excited about if, if something. A pleasure, jo hai, ye, ab khali ye nahi hai ki you become happy. Excitement, ya pleasure, mein dono elements aate hain. Either you, for the sake of, you get nostalgic. To nostalgic, ko itni happy feeling to nahi hoti. You think about something that has passed. It can be positive, it can be negative. So, jab aap ko achhi cheez padenge, so it creates a certain sort of excitement in you. Excitement can be positive, it can be negative. Excitement is the charged state of your uh, mental molecules, basically. So, when you charge state, you don't have charge aapka positive negative ka nahi hai, decide on it. Here, 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 it's only decided that it is going to create some sort of excitement. In the, statement of, in the state of excitement, ideas and feelings do not follow each other in a custom order. Okay? What happens? Okay, when you're in an excited state, you sort of lose control. And when you lose control, you do not understand. I mean, things come out of your mouth, out of your mouth, I just come flash through your mind, your feelings are all jumbled up. So, this excitement is a sort of haphazard, an unruly state create. Kar hai. Is excitement ko control karta hai? meter. If there is meter, the things would be in control. If there is a certain rule of language, if there is certain syllables, if there is certain stress, unstress of syllables, these things would be a little controlled. Pathetic and painful situations can be rendered more effectively in rhyme than in prose. आपने मेलोड्रामा क्रिएट करना है, आपने किसी को रुलाना है, आपने कुछ ऐसी बात करनी है जिसका बहुत ज़्यादा इफेक्ट होना चाहिए। चाहे पॉजिटिव है, चाहे नेगेटिव है, वो वर्स में ज़्यादा इफेक्टिव होती है। आप देखेगा कि जितने अब इलेक्शंस होते हैं, जब तो ये जितनी पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज़ हैं, इंस्टेड ऑफ़ यू नो स्टैंडिंग आउट एंड रेटिंग देर देर इलेक्शन कैंपेन इन प्रोस, दे वुड टेल यू दिस थिंग्स इन फॉर्म ऑफ़ सॉंग्स, ठीक है? वो तो म्यूजिक भी उसमें ऐड हो जाता है। जो वर्स के एलिमेंट है, वो चीजों के लिए ज़्यादा इफेक्टिव होता है। इट क्रिएट्स मोर, इट मेक्स मोर इम्प्रेशन इन यू, इट क्रिएट्स दोस फीलिंग्स ऑफ़ एक्साइटमेंट इन यू and for this purpose, verse is more important and verse is more effective. It imparts a dream-like quality to the poem because of which the pain seems removed and more endurable. Whenever you read poetry, it does create a dream-like state in you. you. You are transferred to another world. It seems as if this is, this is not a part of this world, as if this is something that is happening to someone else. Okay? आप उसके साथ एसोसिएट भी कर रहे होते हैं, but somehow, somehow, you read about these romantic poetries, even in Urdu, if you consider it, if you relate to it, ये जितने रोमांटिक पोइट्स होंगे, जैसे परवीन शाकिर हो गई, या ये वसीशा डू, I don't like him, but all these poets, when they talk of their loved ones, you transport it to another plane. आप इनकी बात करते हैं, when they're talking of you know, losing a loved one, uh, then you transport it to another plane. You associate with that the feeling of melodrama. It enhances with the help of poetry, and because there's a stream-like state, 
um, you feel it, it is surreal. You feel as if you have numbed down. Language is meter to hai, jo achhi language is tamal hui hai, in this proper sequence. It numbs your pain. It makes you feel as if you are standing somewhere else. It looks like an out of body experience. And it seems as if the pain is a little more endurable because it has happened to other people as well. So f the creating of that dreamlike state, creating of this atmosphere is uh, something that can be done with the help of meter. So Wordsworth has placed a lot of importance on this meter. He's not letting it go that easily. It imparts passion to the words and makes the reader experience appropriate feeling of pleasure. If there is no meter, if there is no proper rhyme scheme, if there is no proper, uh, you know, stress and unstress of syllables, jo um, achhi writers hote hain na, they have this poetic license as well. That kahi dafa aise spellings bhi wo create kar lete hain, jo ke unke meter ke liye important hota hai, so that they can have the desired result, so that the stress should come on the right word. So when the stress come on the right word, it sounds right. So when it sounds right, it makes the reader experience experience appropriate feeling of pleasure. It makes the reader feel what they want him to feel. So we derive pleasure from perception of similarity and dissimilarity. The use of meter provides the element of contrast. It tells you the difference. It, the things, they look dissimilar, but there is a similarity, similarity of meter. Every unstressed syllable, hard word me to unstressed syllable a raha hai, wo aapko similarity deta hai. It tells you to find um, it teaches you to find patterns in things that look haphazard. It gives you the element of contrast. So let's start with um, the preface to the lyrical ballad. Whatever Wordsworth has to say about the lyrical ballads, whatever he thinks um, uh, he was writing and his justification for writing what he wrote. Wordsworth wrote the preface with a view to provide a kind of introduction to his poems, which was considered by him to be new, both in theme and style. I have already told you that he has done something that was not done before. He has been original as far as his poetry is concerned. He has written something as far as theme goes, the subject matter goes, the diction goes, the form goes, everything was new. People uh, were following the ancients before him and he was almost among the first which was taking a different um, direction. We already discussed kar chuke hai, ki it was not something that was entirely new because the uh, Anglo-Norman period was called Medieval Ages, which is called Middle Ages. Bhi ये जो मिडिल एजेस के रोमांसेस थे दैट वी हैव यू मस्ट हैव स्टडीड इन हिस्ट्री ऑफ लिटरेचर के मैटर ऑफ फ्रांस था मैटर ऑफ रोम था और मैटर ऑफ ब्रिटेन भी था जो इनके फोकलोर थी जो इनके रोमांसेस थे जो कोटली लव की ट्रेडिशन थी रोमांटिसिज्म की रूट्स उसमें से हैं ठीक है सो इट वाज नॉट समथिंग दैट ही थॉट ऑफ आउट ऑफ ब्लू बट हिज क्रेडिट इज दैट ही हैज थॉट ऑफ थिंग्स दैट वर नॉट सेड बिफोर ही हैज रिटन पोएम्स अबाउट थिंग्स दैट वर नॉट कंसीडर्ड इंपॉर्टेंट इनफ टू राइट अबाउट ही हैज रिटन अबाउट थिंग्स इन अ लैंग्वेज व्हिच वाज नेवर बिफोर यूज्ड बाय पोएट्स फॉर द फेयर ऑफ साउंडिंग इलिटरेट और फॉर द फेयर ऑफ साउंडिंग अनस्कॉलरली he didn't want to present his poem to the public without telling them as to why he didn't follow the conventional style and the theme of neoclassical poetry. So it is very, it's a very hard thing to deviate from the norm. It is very hard thing to be, uh, do something that is not socially acceptable. Okay. Um, you know, we are uh, people who want approval all the time. So if you are doing something that is not approved of by the people um, uh, around you, so you have to explain yourself. So Wordsworth felt that there is a need to explain what he was doing. Um, and that is why he started this uh, collection of his poem with this preface. It's like a essay likha hai, and it's considered one of the greatest piece of literary criticism as well. Because Wordsworth is more famous, okay, people are more famous than his poetry, hai, but jo se genuine readers or genuine appreciate karne wale log hai, they focus on his uh, preface more because this tells you a little more about the person than the poems do. So he says that he wants to tell the public why he's writing what he's writing and he's trying to justify it um, and trying to explain why he has deviated from the normal path of uh, following the uh, Augustans, that is new classics. 
The preface explains the way in which his poems differ from the popular tradition of the age. What was the popular tradition of the age? The popular tradition of the age was to follow the ancients, to follow the rules set out by the ancients, to follow the rules set out by the classical poets of the golden era during the time period of Augustus, Emperor Augustus, new classes. So, us era ko follow karte the. Aur wo khali usko follow nahi karte the, balki wo uske andar aur innovations bhi karte the, claiming that the ancients have stated these things. So, this continued, every new and original poet has to create the taste by which he is read and enjoyed. And the creation of such a taste what was the basic objective in writing the preface. Now this explains everything. Why was he writing this? Because he wanted to create the taste. I've told you he wanted to make the context. When Coca-Cola introduced Karai Gayi Thi Dunya Mein, so people had to have the taste for it. It was, it's not very tasty. Even when you have a lot of time, you have to be able to do it. 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 لیکن اس کے لئے ٹیسٹ ڈیویلپ کیا تھا کوکا کولا کمپنی نے اس کے لئے خاص اٹموسفیر کریئٹ کیا تھا سو مچ ہائپ وز کریئٹڈ ورلز ورد بچارہ ہائپ تو نہیں کریئٹ کرا بٹ ہی اس ٹرائنگ ٹو کریئٹ دی رائٹ اٹموسفیر اینڈ ہاو اس ہی ڈوئنگ اٹ بائی رائٹنگ اس پری فیس ان دس پری فیس اس ٹرائنگ ٹو ایکسپلین وائی وائی اس ہی اوریجنل ہاو اس ہی اوریجنل اینڈ وائی ڈس ہی فیل دس نیڈ to deviate. He's trying to create the taste. He's trying to convince people and he's trying to make them understand why has he written um, these poems with this ordinary subject matter in this ordinary language of the common man. What is the reason behind it? The developing of the taste is the basic reason of writing this. Preface. Though many people do not read prefaces, but this is one of the prefaces that is most widely read in the world. In his preface, he demolishes the new classical poetry. Ab usne uski jisse kehte na dhajya ura dini. Usne dhajya ura dini new classical poetry ki Augustan poetry ki and presents his own theory of poetry that his poems are read and appreciated. In the preface, Wordsworth discusses the nature and function of poetry and poetic process, the qualification of a poet and the poetic truth. Now, these are the things that he has discussed in his preface. The first thing that he has discussed in his preface is that he is going to demolish, he is going to put an end, he is going to um, explain to you why he thinks the Augustan poetry doesn't work, why does he think that it's not original, why does he think that it's not good enough. And then he's going to present his own theory of poetry uh, on which his own poems are written. Okay, just follow carrying or skip any poems or just go appreciate because in the preface Wordsworth discusses the nature of poetry and function of poetry. Poetry kaisi honi chahiye aur uska function kya hai, kyun honi chahiye. کس لئے لکھی جانے چاہیے اس کا پرپس کیا ہے what are you trying to achieve by writing poetry what should be the form of the poetry what should be the subject matter of the poetry and why it should be written the content as well as the end and the purpose the effect of poetry and poetic process poetic process بہت important ہے words سے پہلے poetic process explain کرنے کیوں کوئی خاص کوشش نہیں کی گئی Um, if I forget that Aristotle of course ki thi ke poetry kya hai imitation hai. Horace ne ka poetry kya hai invention hai. Wordsworth ne kaha ke poetry na imitation hai na invention hai. He said this is a collection of emotions that have been overflowing in tranquility. So poetic process according to Wordsworth was something uh, very different from what have been defined before him. So he, he, he said that he, needed to, he, that he needed to redefine it. The process, the qualification of a poet. Who should be a poet? What should be the qualities of the poet? What should be his state of mind? How well settled emotionally he should be? And the poetic truth, whether it's true, whether it's not, whether it should be the subject matter, whether he should be, I mean, the, the purpose of writing poetry, whether it's to preach, whether it's to appreciate nature, whether it's to bring man go, go close to God, whatever the purpose. It's for the sake of pleasure or it's for the sake of, you know, 
poetry for the sake of poetry that is art for the sake of art what is the uh, what is the purpose of it he regards poetry superior to philosophical history and science in a way the preface is a landmark in the history of literary criticism he believes that poetry is the highest art form he believes that even uh, it ranks even higher than science and it ranks even higher than uh, philosophy because he says that poetry answers the very uh, core questions of existence because man questions himself because uski poetry wo wali poetry thi jisme insaan jo hai wo nature ke kareeb hai aur jab wo nature ke kareeb hai to wo um, apne aap se bhi kareeb hai and he can analyze self analysis mein ja sakta hai and then he can answer the questions the basic questions that keeps on bothering him about his existence the preface to the lyrical ballad was perhaps more remarkable than the poems themselves i have told you that people do consider that ke jo uh, the preface likha tha ke wo poems se zyada acche kyunki uski poetry pe to bahut zyada criticism hai ke it's too simple it's very easy it's nice it's pleasurable but it's not you know something extraordinary the preface on the other hand is extraordinary for in the preface the theory of new poetry of romantic age was laid down with great deal leaving no scope for ambiguity and doubt it was very precise it was very to the point everything has been accounted for everything has been answered every definition has been given no room for speculation is left no room for doubt is left he thinks this is romantic poetry this is how should a romantic this is how should poetry should be interpreted this is the criticism um, how a romantic uh, f- a person following the romantic trend would appreciate um, a piece of um, literature a piece of poetry and he leaves no place for anyone to um, you know interfere and do something else with it it was in the preface that wordsworth made bold and categorical statements regarding the nature of poetry and the function of criticism and the role of the poet as a creative artist ab usne bahut si cheezon ko deal kiya hai you have to keep that in mind when you reading this preface to lyrical ballads um you have to keep in mind that he's not only defining poetry for you he's also defining the role of the poet in the society as well he's also defining the role of poetry in the society as well he's telling you ki if you if the poet is a creative artist what should be the purpose of being a creative artist what should be the process of being a creative artist what kind of a person he should be what should be his thought process um how he should deal with the world wo duniya ko apne andar absorb kaise kar raha hai aur usse jo usne absorb kiya hai usko wo let out kaise kar raha hai so this is important so this is these are the topics that he's going to deal with when he's writing um, a preface to the uh, to the lyrical ballad and he's being very bold and he's being categorical this means that he just spell it out he just tells you in black and white that this is what i think and this is this is let's categorize into these four five six headings and this is what poetry is this is the nature of poetry this is the definition of poetry this is the purpose of the poetry this should be the subject matter of the poetry this is the language that should be used for poetry this is the process that is involved um, while you are um, you know doing poetry reading poetry or um, you know writing poetry or appreciating it or criticizing it and that's all so this is about he covers almost everything that you need to know about romantic poetry he's going to tell you and he's going to make you know his grounds well he's going to provide you a good context um with whatever he thinks should be there before you start reading the romantic poetry the preface is one of the masterpieces of english criticism it is intelligent subtle yet extremely clear and provocative ab ye jo hai na play of words you have to focus on that that it is subtle it's intelligent but it is extremely clear and provocative as well he is not only being you know he is being intelligently subtle it means that he has written he has challenged the norm he is being very intelligent about it because he is he is logically he is convinced and his conviction is very strong and when his conviction is very strong he does not have to speak out loud forcefully you know raging at other people and telling them they're wrong and he's right and everything he does not have to do that he has to be very you know subtly wo logic apni ek ke baad dusri ke baad teesri jo hai wo present karta ja raha hai but at the same time he is very clear about what he has to say he does not need other people to i mean he is so convinced that other people cannot move him from what he is thinking he is clear and he is provocative he is not only clear himself he is also provoking people to think to question he is also provoking the augustans and telling them that they are doing it all wrong and his way is the right way 
the preface makes us understand the subject matter of poetry is whatever interests the human mind. यहाँ पे सबसे बड़ा चैलेंज है जो आपने ऑगस्टिन्स को न्यू क्लासिकल्स को दिया है आपने से मेरा मतलब वर्ड्सवर्थ है कि everything that interests the mind it can be anything it can be a table it can be a chair it can be a clock it can be a beautiful girl it could be a car it could be anything it could be a chapati for that matter aapko chapati interest kar rahi hai aapke dimag ko fascinate kar rahi you can talk about it as well in poetry so it would become hilarious at some point but it depends on how you treat the subject matter so wordsworth says that whatever fancies the mind whatever interests the mind that is if a thing is interesting it does not mean at all to say that this is indignified or unpoetic anything can be dignified everything is poetic ab hum sabko lagta hai barish poetic hai patton se pani girna poetic hai khubsurat phool jo hil rahe hain hawa mein aista aista that's poetic but none of us think that this puddle of rain water on the, on the road is romantic but for a poet who has the right bend of mind the puddle of water lying on this in the grass or wherever that romantic as well that that's that can be the subject matter of poetry as well so for as far as words with this concerned nothing was undignified nothing was you know not good enough for poetry everything according to him was good enough for poetry poetry is not about you know a particular subject matter or a particular way of talking about it the lyrical ballads were written as experiments to try out the use of language conversation of real people in poetry uh, they wanted to try and incorporate the language that we use in everyday life into poetry isse pehle ye nahi hota tha isse pehle jo poetry ki language thi it was very different from the language of um uh, everyday life i mean jisme aap mere se baat karenge ya main aap se baat karungi that would be different literary language ke liye kuch aur standards the people used to think that it should be a little what to say ornate it should be scholarly there should be proper words used uh, or us word ki jo highest grade hai wo use karna chahiye lekin uh, is is uh, preface mein usne explain kiya hai ki he does not want to do that he is not going to use language for the sake of it he is going to use language as a as a tool of communication here and the tool of communication would be best uh, put to use if you are using the language of the common man because he'd be more understanding because it would be more easily you know the, the whatever the poet wants to say would be easily communicated if it's written in an easy language easy language is language understood by the people basically the new and unusual and will not suit the taste of the most readers nevertheless the reader is asked to try them with an open mind and not to be put off at the first sight without giving them a fair trial to ye bechara shuru mein aapko yahi batayega jab aap padhenge isko ki he is not he has done something new but he does not want to be judged without reading he wants people to understand what he has written keh rahe ki maine language bhi simple use ki hai maine subject matters bhi rustic aur common use kiye hain country life ko focus kiya hai kyunki mere khayal mein bahut zyada dignified ye koi bhi subject hai wo poetic ya unpoetic nahi hota i have tried everything i have focused on everything and i have given you my reasons for it so i would rather not be judged before you have given me a fair trial you have to judge me after you have read everything i have written and the explanation i have given you for writing the way i have written it in the preface to the lyrical ballad wordsworth says that he has used language and situations from low and rustic life अब लो एंड ड्रस्टिक लाइफ का मतलब ये नहीं है कि इट्स समथिंग डिग्रेडेबल और समथिंग दैट शुड नॉट बी टॉक्ड अबाउट इट्स द लाइफ ऑफ द कॉमन मैन लाइफ विदाउट मच कॉम्प्लेक्सिटीज ऑफ द सिटी लाइफ ठीक है लाइफ विच इज नॉट इन द स्ट्रगल फॉर स्टेटस और बेटर कार और बेटर हाउस और ब्रांडेड क्लोथ्स सो ही हैज फोकस्ड ऑन द लाइफ दैट वॉज सिंपल सो वो सिंपल लाइफ उसको कहाँ मिली थी कंट्री साइड में गाँव की देहात की अब आए आई डिसग्री मे बी यू डू दैट द लाइफ इन दीज एरियाज द कंट्री लाइफ इट्स नॉट एज सिंपल एंड एज रस्टिक एज इट लुक्स टू वर्ड्स बट बट मे बी एज कम्पेयर एज कम्पेयर टू द लाइफ इन द सिटी इट इज सो बिकॉज इन लो एंड रस्टिक लाइफ मैन इज मोर सिंपल 
more direct and nearer to his elemental passions and less affected and artificial in the way he expresses his passion. So Wordsworth believes, because it's like quite a few centuries ago, a couple of centuries ago. So he believed that people who live in these areas, people who have this low rustic life, people who believe or who live in the con who live the country life, who live in the villages, they are a little too close to their nature. They are close to the nature created by God and that's why they are close to themselves as well. They are not artificial. They do not try and pretend. They are not pretentious. They do not, they not, they do not affect things. Um, they do not, you know, uh, look, uh, they do not look down upon people. They are not snobs. They do not judge people on the basis of their possessions. They are closer to their passions. They know themselves. They understand their passions and the workings of their minds. So that is the reason he chose these people as his subject matter, uh, the feelings of these people as his subject matter. Elemental passions means the basic passions. They basically, uh, what is believed is that man is basically truthful, man is basically honest, man is basically pious, man is basically closer to God. So he believes that people who lives in this kind of area and lead this kind of life, they'd be a little you know, elemental, they'd be a little um, down to earth, they'd be a little coarse, but they'll be what men should be. The language of poetry, he says, should not be different from the language of prose. In the same way, poetry does not require specifically poetic subjects. It does not deal with grand or dignified, the sensational, but with the permanent interests of human heart. Ab yaha pe words will differ kar jata hai baaki classes se, and this is the point with this. Thik hai subject matter pe bhi difference aa gaya hai, lekin yaha pe he says that the language of prose and poetry is not different. Ab Aristotle bhi ye nahi kehta, uske baad aane wale log bhi ye nahi kehte. Words wat nahi ke claim kya hai ki language poetry or prose ki essentially ek hi honi chahiye. There is no difference. Why? Because poetry is going to deal with the matters of the heart. It is based on something that comes from your heart. It's based on the emotions that that are driven by your heart. So why, why if the process of creativity starts from the heart, so prose is creativity and poetry is creativity, why would you differ between the two? So everything that's sensational or dignified or grand does not necessarily mean it's good poetry. So if the thing, if you can talk about the ordinary things, if you can talk about the indignified things, if you talk about the, you know, low-lying things, low life, low subject matters, if these can be the subject matter of poetry, then why differentiate between the language as well? Let's focus on both prose and poetry and say that the subject matter as well as the language, there's no difference. Words would say that poetry is the breath and the finest spirits of all knowledge. So he has this high opinion of poetry. All of these critics do, don't you think? Aristotle himself said that poetry is the highest art form. He said that this is the highest, highest art form. It's, it's the spirit and breath of knowledge. I mean, every knowledge is given out through poetry. Knowledge ki spirit hai ye. Knowledge base kar hai poetry pe. Ye poetry jo hai wo knowledge ko aage propagate kar rahi hai. And the poetry is spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings taking its origin from the emotions collected in tranquility. This is very famous line. This, this is basically his definition of poetry. This is how he thinks poetry is created. This is how he thinks it comes into being. That is spontaneous overflow of emotions. Aap kuch dekhte hai, there's certain, there's something that happens to you instantly. That something that happens to you instantly is this spontaneous overflow of emotion. It causes this rush of feeling in you. And when you collect this feeling, when you're sitting peacefully, when you're relaxing, the jo collection of that feeling, the spontaneous overflow of feeling jo thi, un feelings ki recollection, while you're relaxing, tranquility mein, aram se bethe mein, that is when the poetry is created. The qualification of the poets are laid down in conformity with the dignity of his art. The poet is as qualified, as dignified as art is. If the art is dignified, the poet is qualified. And if the art is not dignified, then the poet is not qualified at all. To Wordsworth, a poet is one who possessed of more than usual organic sensibility. There are some terms that you discuss when we are discussing 
birds, birth and its poetry. These terms are going to come again and again. So organic sensibility is one such term. And one who has also thought long and deeply. It would not be a person who is superficial. He would not be much of a talker. He would be a despondent. Despondent is not the right word. Perhaps he would not be a sad person. He would be a thoughtful person. Just uh, say, if you remember Milton's pensive man, tha, the pensive man would be a good poet because he thinks long and deep. He's not a superficial person. He does not look at things and then, you know, forget about them. It's not that if he's seeing a red flower, he's going to enjoy seeing the red flower and then he forgets all about it. But a poet, when he sees the red flower, he's going to enjoy it. There's going to be a rush of feeling in him and he's not going to forget that rush of feelings, the, those feelings that he had. He would sit back uh, in the front of a fireplace, for example, and he would think about the flower again, and he would recapture the feelings that he had while he saw the flowers. So that person would be a poet. That person who can does this process would be a poet. He would have this organic sensibility to be a poet. This is a sense that you have. Organic is something that comes naturally. You just not rage, you know, organic food, organic vegetables, and all these things. Something that is natural. Something that has not been aided by art of artificial means or artificial sources. So someone who thinks long and someone who th thinks deeply as well. Not superficial and not a very impulsive person. Poetry is not created by people who are impulsive. It's not created by people who are superficial. So is key characteristics poetry ki a poet ki johan wo bohat different hai ancients ki they had different ideas about poets what kind of people should be poets kyunki agar aapko yaad ho to classes ne to kaha tha ki poets jo hone chahiye wo they should be the extremely moral personality pious personalities of the time hone chahiye because their duty was to impart wisdom their duty was to impart you know morality ab romantics mein wordsworth ki shayad poet ke liye sirf ye hai ki he should have this organic sensibility and he the only person who has this organic sensibility according to words but can be a poet and he should be thinking deeply and long he should not be impulsive and he should not be superficial the first preface to lyrical ballad this is all just history that the first preface was written in uh, 1800 was published in 1800 it was revised and enlarged in the 1802 edition uske andar ek aur appendix add kiya gaya tha um, in the preface of 1802 edition, Wordsworth added a long account of the nature and the function of poet. Okay? Ye hum use karenge ab. Jab hum preface padenge lyrical ballad ka, to hum 1800 wala nahi padte, balki hum 1802 wala padte. Okay? He answered this question in his own characteristic manner as to what is a poet. Here we understand what him, what according to him is a poet. What he thinks a good poet is. And uh, what kind of a person could be a good poet. We have already discussed it. He declared poets superior to a man of science and analyzed the nature of poetic pleasure. To this edition, Wordsworth also added an appendix on poetic diction. Poetic diction ki theory bhi Wordsworth ki bhoza da important thi, thikhe? To jo 1802 ki edition tha na, 1800 mein to uska preface aaya na. Jo wo preface to the famous ho gaya and Wordsworth realized what he has done, so he continued with it. And in 1802, he not only added his um, uh, 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 another essay to it about what the poet should be like, what should, what kind of a person can be a good poet, and about the nature and function of the poet, but he also added this appendix in which he explained his poetic diction, what poetic diction should be used in poetry, what he thinks according to him was most effective. Wordsworth continued revising and perfecting the preface in each subsequent edition. He barba published hota raha jab tak ki zinda raha, he usko revise karta raha, uske dar addition karta raha, cheeze nikalta raha. But in the edition of 1815, the preface appeared as appendix and the volume was provided with an entirely new preface. In 15 May, a pure new preface likha gaya. Lekin ham us preface se concern nahi hai. We're concerned with the preface that was written in 1802. Okay. Wordsworth say in the preface that although the poet feels for the man and about man and he should write in a way that is understood by man. Ab, this is um, so important. This is almost the fundamental, the, the base. Okay? He should be a man. He should feel for the man. He should feel about the man. 
and he should uh, write in a language that can be understood by other men even if if he's not on the same level with the other men if he does not understand how they feel or about their feelings or their nature and if he does not write in a language that cannot be that cannot be understood by other men then he's not a good boy he has to fulfill these three conditions jaise hum baat karte hain metaphysicals ki to metaphysicals pe to dr johnson ka sabse bada itraaz hi ye tha ki they were talking about things people do not understand and the things they were talking about had nothing to do with common man or with any man at all the uske jo references the jo unki conceits thi they were so far fetched and they, i mean people of highest learning could understand ki jisne geography padhi hai jisne biology padhi hai jisne astronomy padhi hai agar wo unko samajh aayegi to samajh aayegi aam insaan ki nature se uski zindagi se in cheezon ka koi taluq nahi tha so words would say is ke a good poet has to feel how the men feel and um, he should have this feeling about the nature of these men and he should also write in a language that should be understood by other men as well the poet also possesses powers of communication should possess hona chahiye should possess the power of communication jitna acha communicate kar sakega even if he has this you know um, overflow of spontaneous overflow of feelings in him and if he is not able to communicate it then it is of no use he should have memory as well because you know hum sab dekhte hain khoobsurat cheeze hain hum sab ko कुछ चीज़ें चाहे खूबसूरत ना भी हों अफेक्ट करती हैं हम हमें इम्प्रेस करती हैं हमारे पर एक खास इम्प्रेशन छोड़ जाते हैं बट आर मेमोरी इज नॉट एज शार्प एज दीज पोइट्स वुड बी इफ यू आर पोइट यू यू रिटेन द थिंग्स और यू यू परसीव इट इन अ वे दैट यू बी एबल टू रिटेन एंड दिस पोइट शुड हैव पैशन एज वेल दे शुड फील डीपली अबाउट दैट थिंग दे शुड हैव दिस Mm, emotion they should have this this urge to uh, reproduce whatever they were feeling in the preface he makes an attempt to define what makes a poet write poetry to abhi tak hum jitni baatein kar rahe hain beta usse to aapko ye samajh aani chahiye ki the poet is trying to um poet ne mesko keh raha hai words but uh, is is a critic here he is trying to tell you everything um that he has ever thought about poetry and the poet to usme wo ye bhi keh raha hai ki he has to make an attempt to define what makes a poet right poetry wo poetic process ko bhi explain karne ki koshish kar raha hai ki aakhir kya hota hai jab aap poetry likhte kya kya ho ke jata hai aapke andar aamad hoti hai is it an inspiration is it something that you see what is what goes on in your mind and in your heart that makes you write poetry some of his remarks such as emotions recollected in tranquility and spontaneous overflow of emotion are deservedly famous they are quoted everywhere whenever you are asked to define poetry most of the people jitne bhi exams hote hain na is competitive exams and you go for an interview people do ask you these kinds of question and these are the answers that you get as a result of these questions ke poetry is the spontaneous overflow of emotions or is the emotions recollected in tranquility so ye definitions bahut zyada famous hain and they're quite legit as well he is the one of the first writers who altered to describe the inner creative process mai wohi baat jo bhi kar rahe the hum ki he tried and described ki what happens inside a poet what happens inside his heart what happens inside his mind what happens between the two the mind and the heart which overcomes which and as a result of it poetry is created perhaps his best and clearest definition of the poet is of the man who being possessed by more than our usual organic sensibility has also thought long and deep i've already discussed with you but this is his definition of poet that you have this natural ability that you have this natural instinct that it is like the other senses that you have just like every other person has these five senses you have the sixth sense of poetry in you and this sixth sense of poetry would then be uh, aided upon by your nature of thinking long and deep a good poet is not first of all a thinker and a philosopher not is first of all a sensitive soul putting forth his own passions he must write the two qualities of thought on feelings he is different from the other man not in kind but in degree of his qualities which make him write 
that which others feel but cannot express. बेटा ये वही बातें हैं जो हम ऑलरेडी डिस्कस कर चुके हैं बट देर इन डिफरेंट वर्ड्स ऑल्सो कहते हैं कि ही शुड हैव दिस टूल फॉर फॉर कम्युनिकेशन ही शुड फील एंड ही शुड बी एबल टू एक्सप्रेस इट ही शुड हैव द पैशन ही शुड बी अ थिंकर ही शुड बी अ फिलोसोफर बट ही शुड बी अ सेंसिटिव पर्सन एज वेल एंड ही शुड पुट फोर्थ हिज ओन पैशन पैशन ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट हैं थिंकिंग फिलोसफाइजिंग और सेंसिटिविटी ये इतनी इंपॉर्टेंट नहीं है जितनी पैशन इंपॉर्टेंट है ये सब चीज़ें बैक सीट ले लेंगी ये सब चीज़ें जरूरी हैं होनी चाहिए दे डू एड टू द प्रोसेस बट द पैशन इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग है ही मस्ट राइट द टू क्वालिटीज थाट एंड फीलिंग थाट भी उसके प्रोसेस में होनी चाहिए पोइटिक प्रोसेस में और फीलिंग्स भी आनी चाहिए ही इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम अदर मैं नॉट दैट ही इज यू नो डिफरेंट बॉर्न डिफरेंट बट द वे ही ट्रीट्स हिज दीज क्वालिटीज जो क्वालिटीज हैं उसमें डिफरेंट ग्रेड्स में आई हैं ही वुड हैव दिस हाई कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ पैशन और कम्युनिकेशन और फीलिंग और सेंसिबिलिटी सो ही इज लाइक ऑर्डिनरी पीपल ही इज लाइक वट एवरी अदर मैन इज लाइक बट ही वुड हैव दिस एडिशन इन हिम दिस एडिशन एडिशनल फीलिंग दिस एडिशनल पैशन इन हिम In the preface, Wordsworth covers an enormous stretch of ground, throwing out quite effortlessly the most acute observation on the relationship of poetry and science, on the use of meter, at the place of pleasure in art, and as the history of poetry. So, ये सारी चीजें Wordsworth cover करता है यहाँ पे कि वो ना सिर्फ आपको ये बताएगा कि poetry and science का आपस में क्या relationship है, meter कितना important है, pleasure कितना important है poetry के अंदर, poetry का क्या poetry का sole purpose pleasure provide करना है, and the history of poetry as well. He's going to tell you about the history of poetry as well. It raises almost every naughty aesthetic problem. प्रॉब्लम वन कैन थिंक ऑफ जो कुछ आप पोइट्री के बारे में सोचते थे जो कुछ भी आपके ख्याल में क्वेश्चन अराइज हो सकता है चाहे उसकी फॉर्म पे उसकी लुक पे उसकी डिक्शन पे वर्ज वर्ज इज गोइंग टू डील विद ऑल ऑफ दीज प्रॉब्लम एंड डील्स विद दैम इन एन अमेजिंग कॉन्फिडेंस एंड एनर्जी आफ्टर रीडिंग इट वर्ज वर्थ एट लीस्ट आई थॉट लॉन्ग एंड डीप and indolence is the least thing you could be accused of it's not something that he has done you know superficially he has thought about each and every aspect of poetry he has thought about each and every part of it definition se leke uske aage explanation kinds reasons process effects ends achieved everything it's a pleasure to read someone who's sure of his own mind at the same time has nothing dry and blind about him he is convinced about whatever he's writing he's very sure but generally what happens people who are very sure about whatever they have to say they become very boring they become very opinionated and you hate opinionated people they just bore you to death i mean aapko chid hoti hai aise logon se jo apne bare mein itne sure ho but words what you can't say that about words but he makes you interested in poetry This preface leaves a final impression of quite extraordinary combination of creative and critical power of passion and thought. It's a combination. There is this passion in him, and there is this thought in him. It's not only feelings and emotions towards poetry, but there is a logical process going on in his mind. He has a reason for doing whatever he has done. It's not something superficial. It's not that for the sake of you know doing something different. He said, "Ke chalo, ab hum is tarah ki poems likhte." He has a logical reason for doing it. It marks the beginning of a new age. Wordsworth sought to bring about a distinct change from the practice of the preceding generations. We know that he wanted to deviate from the Augustan age. He wanted to change whatever the previous generations have been doing. He does not recognize any unbridged gulf between science and poetry. He thinks everything the poetry uh, deals with nature and science deals with nature. So you can't differentiate between poetry and nature. He disapproves the idea that with the advancement of science, poetry declines. Uh, generally, it's 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 the belief system that right? poetry is something that you do when you have nothing else to think about. But when the hard facts of science are presented, then you can um, let go of poetry. But Wordsworth says that this is not true. The poetry would not decline with science, but it would increase. It would go hand in hand with science. On the other hand, he's of the view that with the advancement of science, poetry becomes familiar with the scientific principles and scientific phraseology and adjusts itself to the new idioms for expressing new thoughts. He has a liberal attitude towards science, and that is appreciable. He's saying um, that you can't differentiate the two things, and it does not mean that if there has been certain new discoveries, if certain new inventions have been made, if certain new places have been discovered, if certain new discoveries have been made, it does not mean that you have to let go of poetry. 
بلکہ ایسا ہوگا کہ if the poet, the kind of poetry that he's talking about that is close to the man um, uh, that's doing the poetry and close to the man who's reading the poetry, then that kind of poetry would adjust itself, would adapt itself to the whatever is happening in the world. تو اگر آپ موڈرن پویچری پڑھے ہیں آپ تو they talk about these modern inventions اس میں انٹرنیٹ کی بات بھی ہوگی اس میں ای میل کی بات بھی ہوگی اس میں امریکہ کی بات بھی ہوگی اس میں ان کانٹیننٹ سے سیاروں کی بات بھی ہوگی so it happens now so Wordsworth has been quite successful Wordsworth has mentioned the idea of imitation in the preface and it is appropriately indicated how poetry is distinguished from history deals in generation امیٹیشن کی بات ہوئی ہے کہ ایرسٹوٹل نے کہا تھا کہ پویٹری جیسے امیٹیشن ورڈس ورڈ ڈسگریز سو فرم ورڈس ورڈ ٹائمز تو ہیس ٹائم فرم ایرسٹوٹل ٹائم تو ورڈس ورڈ ٹائم تو ورڈس ورڈ ٹائم پویٹری جیسے لانگر ان امیٹیشن ورڈس ورڈ سبسکرائب تو ویو دیٹ تو پویٹ تو پرٹیکلر از ناثنگ ان یونیورسل از ایوریتنگ The poet has to be universal according to words, but he has to deal with things mm, that are universal. They should, whatever he has to write has to be universal, has to have a universal appeal. If he is not writing universally, if he is not talking about things that exist for everyone, that everyone can feel, everyone can identify with, he is not a good poet. As regard the end of poetry, Wordsworth makes departure from Aristotle. Aristotle ne kya kaha tha? Poetry is there for the sake of pleasure. For Aristotle, Plot is the primary thing. The idea of delight as the end of the poetry is neither explicitly nor elaborately mentioned. On the other hand, Wordsworth emphasized pleasure to be the end of poetry. Wordsworth said that pleasure is ultimate. Whether it's a plot, a diction, whatever it is, if it's providing pleasure, it's good poetry. Aristotle has all focus on plot. If the plot is good, then the exact end should be achieved. The end is different. Wordsworth had described the theory of poetry and his conception of the function of a poet. In his theory of poetry, he sets down the origin, nature and purpose of poetry and the function of the poet in a civil society. The theory of poetry is focused on the things that it will define. What is the poetry? What is the nature of poetry? Why will it be achieved? What will it be achieved? And the poet will do what he will do. And the poet will do what he will do. What purpose is it going to serve the society? what should be the place of poet in the society. Wordsworth defines poetry as the spontaneous overflow of feelings, powerful feelings. It takes its origins from emotions, recollected in tranquility. The emotions is contemplated through the tranquility disappears and an emotion kinder to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced and does itself actually exist in mind. Uh, I've already explained this, but I'll do it again, that you have to, this, you, you see something. And when you see something, there's this spontaneous overflow of your emotions in your mind. You see that thing and you go back home. You go back home and you're resting in your armchair and you recall the thing. Uh, you're, you're tranquil, you're in, in the state of rest, and the powerful feelings, when they're recollected, then they're expressed in the form of poetry. The emotion that they would produce would be the same as that of the contemplation. So that would be then replaced, gradually produced, and does itself actually exist in mind. So the form of uh, words will be in your mind and finally in poetry ki form in paper. Pe the clear spring of poetry must flow spontaneous and freely. It cannot be made to flow through artificially laid pipes. Poetry is born not in the mind but in the heart, overflowing with feeling. Poetry is produced by a man who, being possessed of more than organic sensibility, had also thought long and deep. Poetry is something that comes to you naturally, something that has to flow freely. You cannot, you know, put it into certain pipes. What does this mean? It means that you can't restrict these things. You can't restrict poetry that it has to be about these certain things and should be done in these certain language and in these certain words. Wordsworth was dissatisfied with the 18th century poetry. He was not happy with the contemporary poetry for a number of reasons and composed poems which differ from the neoclassical poetry, both in matter and manner, in the content as well as in their style. He felt a regret that some of his contemporaries have introduced trivialities and meanness of thought and language in their magical composition. But Wordsworth's poems differ from those of his contemporaries, of that of enlightening the readers and purifying their affections. 
اب اس زمانے میں جیسے اگر آپ ریپ آف لاک کے اگزامپل لیتے ہیں تو it was about a very trivial thing this rape of this lock of a girl was you know cut off by the scissor اور اس کے اتنا لمبا ایک اپک اس نے اس پر کریئٹ کر گیا تھا so what what is against you know making these trivial things matter of so much importance he has also talked about trivial things he has also talked about things that occur you know commonly but he has done it in such a way that it has purified our emotions he castigate poets who separate themselves from sympathies of men and who indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression in order to furnish food to fickle taste and fickle appetites of their own creation. He's being very sarcastic and he's being very critical of poets who create uh, pieces of poetry, who create poetry, who create literature just to, um, just to address or adhere to the taste of a few people. Just to um, you know, provide the this addiction that people have for the use of scholarly language. So that's about all, and we're going to continue discussing uh, Wordsworth's uh, preface to lyrical ballads in a little more detail. The next lecture. Thank you.